Well, Luke chapter 12 marks the halfway point in Luke's gospel. And we have to keep in mind here that Jesus is still making his way to Jerusalem. In this chapter, Luke records five warnings from the Lord. The first four warnings are warnings that believers must heed if we're to be faithful disciples. The fifth, which will be covered at the end, is a warning that should be heeded by a lost world. And what I mean by the end is at the end of this chapter. This week, as we cover the first two warnings, the Lord will show us the kind of attitude His followers, his followers should have in the face of persecution and attitudes regarding material possession. So my prayer is that by the end of this message, the Lord will make it clear to you that as a believer, you have no reason to fear or worry. And also understand the importance of having a proper perspective about wealth and possessions. So before we get into God's word, let's come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful that you've allowed this day to happen, that, um, that all of us are here right now, Lord. That all those that are watching online um, have clicked on, on, this, on this video or on this audio and are listening to this, to this message. I am thankful for that, Lord. I pray that you will bless this message, Lord, that you will speak powerfully through it, that everyone that's here, that's watching, listening, will be blessed by it, Lord. Lord, you want to hear from you. Soften our hearts and minds, Lord. There's a message here for everybody. Whether it's, again, uh, uh, the whole message, whether it's a passage, a verse, a word, or a sentence, a word, Lord, there is a message in there, and I just pray that people will see it, they will understand it, and they will be moved and changed by it, Lord, because your word is powerful in that way. So again, use me as your instrument, and use me as your vessel to speak your truth, and fill this place with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands came together so that they were trampling on one another. He began to say to his disciples first, Be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered. Nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body, but after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has the authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And I say to you, anyone who, is, anyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers, and authorities, don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say. 
for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. In this section we just read, the Lord warns us to beware of hypocrites and encourages not to allow fear to control our lives, but to rely on the Holy Spirit. Luke here in verse 1 reminds us, immediately tells us that while the events at the end of chapter 11 were taking place, a crowd of many thousands had gathered and were trampling on one another. Upon noticing the mob, the Lord turned his attention to his disciples and told them to be on guard against the leaven, or maybe some of your translations will say yeast, of the Pharisees. Now, a quick word search in the New Testament will reveal that the word leaven, or again yeast, was typically associated with corruption and evil. And a good example of this can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Here, Jesus explained that leaven symbolized the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now, I, I talked a little bit about this last week, but just to remind you, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word that means an actor, one who plays a part. Now, you will find hypocrites in every walk of life. You'll find people who will pretend to be someone they're really not in order to impress others. And just to name a few, there are hypocrites in politics, in business, in entertainment, in sports, and yes, in even, in, even in the church. In the Christian life, hypocrite is somebody who tries to appear more spiritual than they really are. They will do and say whatever they can to maintain their fake Christian mask. So no one will find out who the true person is underneath that mask. So the idea here is that hypocrisy is like leaven in the sense that it only takes a little bit to affect an entire mass. An entire church can be ruined by hypocrisy. And it can also ruin a person as it gradually works its way through their life and their relationships. By telling his disciples, by telling this to his disciples, Jesus wanted them to make up their minds. Did they want to please the prominent religious authorities of their day? Or, were they, or would they display their trust in God? You see, to please the Pharisee, a person had to pretend to please God while living a self-sufficient life of pride in self self-sufficient pride of, uh, of pride in self and in contempt of others. Our Lord then uses two proverbs to further explain the futility and folly of hypocrisy. First of all, in verse 2 he explains that hypocrisy is a short-sighted practice because what is hidden will eventually be exposed. You see, the art of the, of the hypocrite depends on how well he or she thinks they could conceal it. Jesus, however, makes it clear here that whatever secrets the hypocrite is hiding, it'll be uncovered and be made known by God. Whether you're in ministry or not, everyone everyone should heed this warning. This is one of those warnings that keeps me accountable, keeps me from thinking I can hide a sin, thinking I can hide behavior and that, that isn't right, that, that would disqualify me here in the pulpit. See, pride 
will fool you, fool anybody into thinking they'll never get caught. But the fact is this, eventually your secret sin will be exposed. Doing, if you just do a simple Google search for pastor resigns or pastor arrested or pastor is fired, it will show that Jesus wasn't lying. For instance, here's one I found from November 2019. A lead pastor from a Baptist megachurch in Minnesota resigned from his post amid an investigation into allegations from two women who say he manipulated them into sexual relationships while they were teenagers 17 years ago. This pastor has spent 17 years in the ministry keeping this sin a secret until it was exposed. And there are countless of other stories like this. Here's what I'm getting at. Even if it isn't sexual sin, whatever sin you're hiding, it's going to be found out. So before it, 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 that happens, before it leaves a trail of destruction for you and those around you, come to the Lord, confess it, repent, and He will forgive you. He's not going to say, oh, hey, you messed it up. You messed up again. That's your last chance. There's no other chances. You're done. He's not going to react like your wife. He's not going to react like your husband. He's not going to react like your mom or dad. God is an ever-loving God, and, 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 and he, he forgives. He will forgive you. But you must get rid of that pride. You must get rid of that that those thoughts that you're not good enough or that he, he will never forgive you, He will. And there's no greater feeling than, than that weight of sin being lifted off your shoulders. Come to Him before it's too late, before it's exposed. Yeah, you may still have to suffer some, deal, suffer some consequences. But maybe, just maybe, the Lord will spare, spare you from bigger ones that could have occurred. Proverbs 28.13 says this, The one who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Now secondly, in verse 3, he explains that what is whispered in private will eventually be made public. The, the hypocritical Pharisees had been, gathering together, had been gathering together in secret meetings and, and were plotting ways to gain prominence and a following just for themselves. In these meetings, they judged people and spoke behind their backs, assuming no one would find out what they were doing. Jesus, however, reminded them that God knows all, and at the final judgment, if not before, He will reveal all. Believers, brothers and sisters in, in Christ, no matter how hard you try, Jesus makes it clear that you cannot hide hypocritical words or actions. Again, while doing a Google, the Google search that I mentioned before, I came across another article describing how a married pastor with two kids was removed from ministry because he was secretly posting messages with pictures in an online dating app. He probably had a, a pseudonym, a fake name, and, and was trying to keep it secret and not letting anybody know um, what he thought he was doing in private eventually was proclaimed on the housetops. He was exposed. Someone from that dating website recognized him and, 
and put it out there. And all of a sudden, it like, like a kindle in the, on a hot day in the, in the woods, it caught fire and all of a sudden the media got a hold of it and it's, it was all over the news. He got exposed. He thought he was doing something privately and it was found out about. Now here's something I've learned. I've also learned. Wicked people will befriend you. And when they befriend you, they will give you an ear to tell them things to, to conf that you can confide in. But those wicked people, those wicked people, it's only a matter of time before they'll betray you and reveal your secrets to others, to the world even. Here's what Proverbs 4.16 says about them. For they can't sleep unless they've done what is evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. Sin secret sin, secret words, secrets, these secrets won't be secrets for long. They'll be found out. And I know, I know from experience. So after warning his disciples to guard themselves from the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, Jesus then encourage them not, encourages them not to fear man, but rather fear God. Again, we have to remember that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem knowing that he would be betrayed and crucified. He was thus illustrating what he taught here. The hypocritical religious leaders would go after him, get him, and kill him. But they wouldn't be able to stop God's plan for his life. He knew there was a limit to what men like the Pharisees could do to him. And that limit can go, could go no further than physical death. So he told his disciples to do the same. Not fear what their persecutors would do to them. Since all they could do is kill the body. And after that, can do nothing more. Instead... They ought to fear God since He is the final judge and can condemn the soul for all eternity. Warren Wisby wrote that the fear of God is the fear that, conquer, that conquers all other fears. For the person who truly fears God need fear nothing else. Now what this means for us is that life on this earth isn't what's important. Our focus, your focus, instead should be on eternity. Anything or anyone, and that's in, even including the coronavirus, anything or anyone whose power is limited to what they can do in this world, deserves no attention and should matter little. However, the one with the power to determine your eternal destination deserves your focus. So fear God and ignore everyone else. Here's how King David put it in Psalm 56 verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Friends, as believers, we mustn't fear death as unbelievers fear it. Why? Because as Erwin Lutzer puts it, the day of our death is the day of our glorification. 
Death is the grand entrance, the door that swings into eternity. Eventually, it'll open in God's time and in God's way to let another child come home where he or she belongs. Now, to emphasize God's protective interest in his disciples, the Lord mentions the Father's care for sparrows. In Matthew 10, 29, we read that two sparrows are sold for a penny. Here, we learn that five sparrows are sold for two pennies. In other words, an extra sparrow is thrown in for free when four are purchased. And yet, not even this odd sparrow with no commercial value is forgotten in God's sight. So if God cares for that odd sparrow, how much more does he watch over those who go forth in the gospel of his son? Now compare this to yourself. In God's eyes, you are just as valuable and important as that sparrow. In fact, you mean so much, so much to him that he, that he, that the hairs on your head are all, are all counted by him. Every single strand of hair, even if you hardly have any, he counts them all. He knows them all. He has known them all from the time you were born. He has counted them. Yes. He cares for you in this world and in the world to come. You are valued. You are important to Him. He loves you. And He wants you to know Him. He wants you to, to have a relationship with Him. He wants you to know how important you are to Him. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 tells us this. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that's, I got that from the New Living Translation. Therefore, friends, with this in mind, have, have fear and reverence for the one who values you, not for the one who opposes you. Jesus then goes on to explain verses 8 and 9 that when God is feared, there's no fear before men. He tells the disciples that anyone who acknowledges him before others, that he is the Son of God, the promised Messianic Savior, he, as the Son of Man, will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. In his glorious kingdom, here, He's speaking of all true believers. To confess Him is to receive Him as your only Lord and Savior. Now let me ask you, what do you think happens when earthly fear takes over? When you're in the midst of that fear, what will you do when the religious hypocrites come after you when they came, like they came after Jesus. Will you join in their hypocritical line and say, you never knew Jesus? Or will you confess that Jesus is your Lord? How you answer that question when you're tested will determine how Jesus will recognize you before the angels of God. 
the test to either confess or deny Jesus before men, before your friends, before your family, may come in many ways. But somehow and some way, I can guarantee you it'll come. And when it does, it'll be helpful to, be, to already be determined in your heart and convinced in your mind where you stand and what you believe in Jesus. If you're confused and if you don't know and if you don't care, if you're you know, just indifferent, then when you are tested, when people come up to you, when religious hypocrites ask you whether you know Jesus, it's going to be very easy to be like, mm, not really. But if you're convinced in your mind, if, if you know in your heart, if you believe in your heart in Him, there's no way, there's no way you can say, no, I can't. I don't, I don't know. There's no way you can deny Him. So just like He did in Luke chapter 11, verse 23, the Lord is calling us. He's calling you. He's calling His listeners. Everybody who's reading this to make a choice. There in Luke chapter 11, verse 23, the choice was either to be or against him. Here, the choice is to confess him or deny him. Now, I can only imagine what it would be like, what it's going to be like when I arrive in heaven and hear my Lord and Savior put me to as he puts me in front of all his angels, the multitude of angels, and say something like, Hey, everyone, this is Angel. Here, this guy here, he's Angel. He confessed me before men, even though he knew that that he would be laughed at, that he would be scorned, that he would be mocked. He confessed me. And now I'm confessing or I'm acknowledging him, acknowledging him before all of you. Before all you, all the millions and millions of angels. I'm recognizing him before you just like he did with me on earth. I, I can only imagine that's what it would be. It was just going to sound something like that, but maybe it's going to be more glorious and, and I'm going to be like just in awe and in shock and I think you will be too. That is, that is again, if you're the person, if you confess him before others. In verse 10, our Lord explained to his disciples that there's a difference between criticism of him and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Those who speak against the Son of Man will be forgiven if they repent and believe. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now this is one of those controversial passages that many churches and denominations have gone off and made their own um, um, interpretations, um, doctrines. Um, but let me first, again, also just first, before I share with you what I believe Jesus is speaking of here, let me first share with you the context. Jesus is speaking of the sin uh, that the Pharisees were guilty of committing. Now what was that sin? They were attributing the miracles of the Lord Jesus to the devil. See Acts 10:38 makes it clear that the miracles Jesus performed came from the spirit from God's spirit, came from the power of God's spirit. 
So by claiming that he was doing it by the power of Satan, they were essentially saying that God's spirit is the devil. To say such a thing was outright blasphemous. And what Jesus was saying was that there is no forgiveness for this sin at all. Now, this sin cannot be committed by a true believer. Now, even though some will claim or believe that they've committed it by backsliding, the truth is, backsliding isn't the un unpardonable sin. See, a backslider can be restored to fellowship with the Lord. And also, if a backslider feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it just proves that God is still working in them. The Holy Spirit is still in them. They haven't committed the unpardonable sin. If you come up to me and tell me, hey, you know what, Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with so-and-so sin, with gossip or pornography, I'm struggling with, you know, um, uh, just drugs and, uh, you know, I'd be, first I would say, good. And then I'm sure you would, might tell me, well, what do you mean good? I would explain it means that God is still working in you. It means that He cares about you so much that He's shaking things up inside of you. That's a good thing. Conviction is a good thing. It means God is in there and He's still working. And there's still hope, there's still a chance. And, and again, you have not committed the unpardonable sin if you've backslidden. Furthermore, an unbeliever who rejects Christ while they're still alive isn't necessarily guilty of the unforgivable sin either. Yes, a person may spend the majority of their lives not wanting anything to do with the Savior. But guess what? Here's the thing. God will still forgive them of their sins if they turn to Jesus. Even if they're converted on their deathbed. Now, of course, if they die in unbelief, conversion is no longer possible. And the Bible is clear that when that happens, to, that the Bible is clear that what happens to those who die in their sin. So in this instance, yes, rejection of the Holy Spirit is unpardonable. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, not because it's a sin too big for God to forgive, but because it's an attitude of the heart that cares nothing for God's forgiveness. It never has forgiveness because it never wants forgiveness God's way. It may want forgiveness in its own terms, but never God's way. The way to not blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to receive Jesus Christ and to put your loving trust in Him by surrendering your heart to Him, by opening the doors of your heart to Him, to your life, bringing Him in, removing the trash, and allowing Him to come in. It means to stop rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing you to Jesus. Now, our Lord was well aware that his disciples would face severe consequences, consequences for choosing to confess him. So he encourages them by reminding them of the promise of the Holy Spirit. When accused and threatened for commitment to Christ, there is no need to worry about how they should defend themselves or how to respond. Why? Because Jesus promised that at that very hour, the Holy Spirit would put the proper words 
in their mouths. Now this is a promise that we can hold on to as well. If we ever find ourselves in a situation where life or death depends upon what we say. Now in order to understand this promise, the, the promise provision of at that very hour, it's important to understand two things it's not. It's not what you think you would say in that hour. And secondly, it's not some new supernatural, supernatural or revelatory information that's not found in Scripture. This is a promise from the Lord that He'll bring to mind at the appropriate time the truths you learned reading, studying, and hearing the Word preached. Who knows? If you're ever in this situation, God may bring to mind something that I said, I just said, or I'm about to say. And He'll, he'll allow you to say those things like that. You know, as if you had memorized it, you know, the entire message. That's how it is. That's how God works here. Again, through what you've read, what you've studied, and what you've heard. If you hear someone bring new, trying to say that they have a new revelation from Christ or from God, if it's not found in Scripture, I would, yeah, I would stay clear away from it and it's just nonsense because God doesn't contradict Himself. He is the same today and, and forever and for all eternity. He doesn't change. His Word is constant. This means, again, that when you testify in a situation like this, the Spirit will do all the work. He will reveal to you exactly what you need to say, when to say it, and how to say it. And don't worry, He won't need your help. You may memorize your speeches and practice them all you want, but when you're standing before your accusers, those speeches won't matter. Why? Because you're not responsible for figuring out, figuring out what to say. You are responsible for saying what the Spirit tells you to say. The ultimate test of your dependence on God is allowing Him to give you the words to speak in a time of crisis. When you have the time, read about the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And as you read, ask yourself if you think this was a speech that he had memorized or if it was the Holy Spirit speaking through him. If that was an instance where the Lord gave him the words, the right words at that exact moment until he was finally taken up to, to be with the Lord. I would say that yeah, it's clear to me, and maybe again it's from the Holy Spirit confirms it, but it, it wasn't a memorized speech. He didn't have it in his back pocket in case that situation happen, happened. It came from God. Now, I know I started a little bit later today, or a little bit late today, but I do want to end by, by taking a look at another warning from the Lord regarding material possessions. So please turn back to your Bibles and, let's, uh, and follow along as I, as I read from verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, Who appointed me a judge or arbitrator, arbitrator over you? He then told, him, then told them, 
Watch out and be on guard against all greed because there's one because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. He then told them this parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grains and goods there. Then I will say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I hope that you can see that the main idea here is that since money is irrelevant in eternity, we shouldn't let the fear of financial failure control our life. This account begins with an anonymous member of the crowd interrupting Jesus. He wanted to set Jesus up as a human judge and decide on an inheritance dispute between him and his brother. The Lord, however, wasn't about that. He was like, no. <laughs> he, he refused to take part in the matter since, it hadn't come, since he hadn't come into the world to deal with trivial disputes. That was the responsibility of the court system. Nevertheless, he did make, although he didn't make a legal judgment, Jesus did make a moral one. He informed the man that his request showed how greedy he actually was and explained that greed, the inordinate desire for more, is pointless because life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. That is, there's more to life than stuff that a person accumulates in this temporal existence, in this world. In fact, there's another transcendent existence that that stuff, that the stuff of this life is to serve. For example, and these are big ones again, uh, boats, cars, planes, vacation homes can be used as tools to preach the gospel internationally and domestically. If you have something, let me break it down even more simple terms or very, you know, maybe common things we all use. If you have an extra pair of shoes, if you have an extra phone, if you have an extra, if you have extra clothes that you don't use, these possessions, they could be used to help others who may, be ne who may need them. Maybe children in, in, in Juarez or who don't have these things don't have a lot. I remember, real quickly, I, I remember I used to always wonder why a lot of, as I was growing up, a lot of my clothes used to disappear. <laughs> and it wasn't until later on that I realized that my mom was handing them over to my cousins in Tijuana. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. Because I would see them, when I would go visit them, I would see them wearing something like, hey, this, this looks like my shirt, you know. Um, I just, I just hope it wasn't, wasn't any of my underwear. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, no, they, I, my mom would do that because when she would buy us new clothes, she would get rid of the old. I know there's people out there that have closets and closets and closets full of clothes that, that just sit there and are never used. Take them out. Give them, give it away. There's a lot of people out there who may need it. Anyways, um, you can do a lot with all the extra stuff you have. However, if you live with an attitude that your life does consist in what you possess, 
you're living in covetousness. And covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness, the unquenchable thirst for getting more and more of something we think we need in order to be truly satisfied. It may be a thirst for money or things that money can buy or even a thirst for position or power. Now just to be clear, Jesus, our Lord, didn't deny that we have certain basic needs. He only affirmed that we won't make life richer by acquiring more than the basic necessities. Jesus then illustrated this his teaching with a parable of a farmer over uh, of a farmer how a farmer overcame all all, all sorry all agricultural odds and achieved great success. My mouth started kind of doing a weird thing with that. <laughs> um, but this brought a new problem. What do you do with your riches? How do you store it until you can sell it or use it? How can you keep it from rotting and ruining? Well, the answer to him was obvious. Tear down the obsolete barns and build bigger ones. This is a great short-term solution, but he could have used that capital to invest in feeding the poor, buying medicine for the sick, and he could have donated his unused possessions to those who really needed them. Regrettably though, in his self-centered perspective, he thought this was an effective strategy for a long life of leisure and pleasure. But God had other plans. He told the farmer that he died that very night and then asked him, he then, God then asked him, I think this is pretty funny, who will reap the rewards that he had prepared for himself? Who's, who's, all this stuff you accumulate, all this stuff that you had prepared for your, for your retirement, for just your, this life that you thought you were going to have, who's, who's going to have it? Who's it going to belong to now? Notice there that there wasn't a reply. There was no reply. Because at that point, it didn't matter anymore. Everything that that farmer, that that man had accumulated, owned, possessed, was now worthless to him. It meant nothing. We're given the point in verse 21. The one who stores up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. The greatest tragedy in this story is not that the not that the man left behind what the man left behind, but what lay before him. Eternity without God. The man lived without God and died without God. And his wealth was but an, an incident. It was just an incident in his, in his life. Sure, having loads of money boatloads of money will buy you many things but it has one major weakness it has no value after death but here's the thing although the world may consider your faith in Christ valueless God considers it more precious than all the wealth in the world let me read to you what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 9. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 9, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now 
for a short time if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though, you, though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In verse 20, Jesus asked this important question, whose will they be? We might well ask ourselves the question, if Christ were to come today, to whom will my possessions go to? If you're shrugging your shoulders, let me tell you this. It's much better to use them for God today than to let them fall into the devil's hands tomorrow. Learn from this parable of the rich yet foolish farmer and avoid being trapped by the short-sightedness of temporal wealth. Instead, invest in an eternal treasure where moths and rust cannot destroy faith in Christ and a relationship with God. Spurgeon said, your main and principal motive as a Christian should always be to live for Christ. To live for glory, yes, but His glory. To live for comfort, yes, but be all your, but, but be all your consolation in Him. To live for pleasure, yes, but when you're merry, sing psalms and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. To live for wealth, yes, but to, the, but to be rich in faith. You may lay up treasure, you may lay up treasure, but lay it up in heaven. As I close here, the two principles, these two principles should have stood out to you in these two passages we read. A Christian has no reason to fear or worry and possessions and possessions, and number two, possessions and wealth are useless unless in, in dedicate, are useless in dedicating oneself to God and may actually be a hindrance. Brothers and sisters in Christ, church, and fellow believers, if you're desirous to be a faithful follower, then heed the warnings from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beware of hypocrisy. It's not a matter if, of, of if your sin will be exposed. It's a matter of when it will be. Do not fear those who, those, those who, those, don't, do not fear men, but rather fear God. The extent of what a person can do to you goes no further than death. But God has the authority to kill both the body and the soul. Acknowledging or denying Jesus in this world will be reciprocated in heaven. You are valuable. Through Christ, God sees you as his, as his infinite, precious child. Trust in the Holy Spirit. In a time of crisis, and in a time of crisis and when you're called to testify, He will teach you at that, every, at that very hour what must be said. And lastly, your life is not the abundance of your possessions. Earthly wealth is temporal and has no eternal value. What matters most is the eternal value God places on those who put their trust their faith and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, thank You for this message. Thank You for revealing these truths to us, Lord. I pray that 
those who heard it, that they, were, they received it and they will, be, they will accept it and be transformed by it, Lord. May all of us heed these warnings, Lord, and also see and be encouraged by the encouraging words that are found here. Help us, Lord. Help those who, who are living in fear. Remind them that the fear of man is, is nothing. May their focus be on the goal, and that's to be in eternity with you. Give us a proper perspective of our wealth, our possessions, what we have, what we don't have, Lord. Let us not see wealth as an answer to, the, to our problems. Let us see that you are. Let us see the truth that only you have the answers. Bless everyone's week, Lord, coming up. Protect them from this virus. Keep them safe, Lord. And may they minister to those who are hurting, who are scared, who are anxious. May they be used powerfully and mightily by you. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for, for all you do for us every single moment, every single day. Thank you for being our, for being our Savior. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.